I'd like to thank the very patient Dr. Donald Thomas. <laughs> and I'd like to invite him to the podium, Donald Thomas. Dr. Donald Thomas is the author or co-author of more than 100 scientific journal articles, book chapters, and books. His 2001 article in the journal Science and Justice, titled The Acoustical Evidence in the Kennedy Assassination Revisited, led to publication of Hear No Evil, Please welcome Dr. Donald B. Thomas. Okay. Thank you, Alan, and thank you all for hanging in. Yes, sir. I'm going to talk about the Warren Commission. Following publication of the Warren Commission, there was a plethora of books that uh, documented the disconnect between the Warren Commission's findings as embodied in the Warren Report and the Warren Commission's evidence as embodied in the hearings and exhibits. Uh, mindful of that criticism, a former Warren Commission junior counsel, David Bellin, published his own book, uh, November 22nd, You Are the Jury, wherein he uh, referred to the Tippett murder, uh, the murder of police officer J.D. Tippett by Lee Harvey Oswald, as the Rosetta Stone of the case. Now, he explained that by killing Tippett, Oswald had implicated himself in the murder of Kennedy. He explained that if, if he hadn't killed Kennedy, if he was just a patsy, then he would have no reason to kill Tippett. Well, I realize that that's, that's a non sequitur, and I also realize that it's kind of exaggeration, at least overused, to refer to it as the Rosetta Stone. But it is an exemplar of how the Warren Commission uh, mishandled, misrepresented the evidence in order to hide uh, evidence of conspiracy. Uh, J.D. Tippett was shot and killed in a neighborhood called Oak Cliff, about four miles away and about 40 minutes after the assassination. Uh, in response to the radio calls of the shooting, uh, police units swarmed into the neighborhood and soon found Lee Harvey Oswald hiding in a nearby movie theater. When Oswald was arrested, uh, he refused to identify himself. And so one of the arresting officers, Paul Bentley, uh, the detective, uh, the guy chomping on the cigar, simply extracted his wallet from his back pocket and therein found uh, not one but uh, two ID cards, one of which said his name was Alec Heidel, the other of which said his name was Lee Harvey Oswald. So Bentley asked him, which one are you? And so Oswald gave the snide answer. He said, you're the detective. You figure it out. Well, one of the mysteries is why the Warren Commission never called Detective Bentley to testify uh, and to uh, authenticate the discovery of this crucial evidence because this name, Alec Heidel, was the name that was used to order the mail order and to pay for the weapon, the alleged murder weapon. Uh, in retrospect, and by the way, Bentley was the one who gave the polygraph to uh, Wesley Frazier. So the question is, why was the Warren Commission never call him in to testify, never deposed him, flew 98 witnesses back to Washington? In spite of the importance of that evidence, they never <clears throat> asked Bentley to testify. <clears throat> In retrospect, it might have been because they cared not to explain the second ID card that Oswald had and how to explain that he had an ID card issued to government contractors that need uh, access to military bases, uh, perhaps more specifically what agency of the government Oswald was under uh, contract with. There's no mention of this ID card in the Warren Report and is conspicuously missing from the Warren Commission's exhibits wherein all of the other contents of Oswald's wallet were depicted photographically. Uh, so the other mystery about the wallet that's in the wallet, the other clue, is that there was only $13, which raises the issue of what kind of escape plan did Oswald have that did not require funds, uh, which leads to the possibility that he was expecting help. So the Warren Commission simply said, well, he had no escape plan. Well, in the annals of presidential assassins, uh, it would be reasonable to suppose that none of these folks had escape plans because they all shot the, their respective presidents 
from point blank range with a pistol and therefore had little expectation uh, that they could escape. But uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is, is, is charged with having shot the president with a sniper rifle from a distant hidden location, the whole point of which is to get away, to escape. So it doesn't seem entirely plausible that he did not have an escape plan. If he's going to escape plan, that means there has to be a rendezvous point, a meeting point. For starters, when Oswald took the taxi cab from downtown out to Oak Cliff, uh, the cab drivers in those days kept a log, and this cab driver entered that his destination was 500 North Beckley. So this isn't hearsay, it's not somebody's memory. He actually wrote it down. It's documentary evidence that Oswald wanted to go to 500 North Beckley. Well, 500 North Beckley is a Mexican restaurant. So are we to believe that having just shot the President of the United States, Oswald is overwhelmed for a desire for Mexican food? <laughs> because if it is, I want to know, was it the Tampacania or was it the uh, Chile's Rellenos? Uh, if, this, if the Warren Commission had been a real investigation, if they had taken this seriously, they'd have tossed that restaurant and checked out who worked there, who might be hanging out there. Why would Oswald want to go there? Well, in point of fact, uh, about a block shy of the Mexican restaurant, Oswald turned and he went back. After he got off the cab, he told the cab driver, this is close enough. He got out and he went back to his boarding house. And we now know that he went back there in order to get his pistol. And while he was in his room getting his pistol, according to the, the housekeeper, Earlene Roberts, said there was a beep beep, and she looked out the window and saw a Dallas squad car at the curbside. So the Warren Commission had a dilemma. How do you explain the presence of a Dallas squad car at Oswald's neighborhood one half hour after the assassination, long before uh, Oswald is identified as a suspect, and have an explanation that was both plausible and innocent. So they simply decided that, well, it never happened and that Ms. Earlene Roberts was just a uh, teller of tall tales. In fact, she gave some details. She said that when she looked at that squad car, it was not a policeman that she knew and there was two policemen in that squad car. Well, of course, uh, we now know that, uh, well, there's no reason for Earlene Roberts to, why would she make up a tall tale? She was not a person who came to them out of the blue. She was a real witness to real events. She didn't have to make up a story in order to get the attention of the world. She already had everyone's attention. And uh, uh, besides, we know who the teller of tall tales are. It was the Warren Commission. Uh, and we know who it was that there was a squad car in the neighborhood that had no business being there. It was the one being driven by J.D. Tippett. So the tall tale of the Warren Commission told us, first of all, it says that Tippett patrolled District Number 78, that's true, in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas. That's not true. He, he was assigned to Cedar Crest, miles away. So he had left his assigned area and had gone to Lee Harvey Oswald's neighborhood. The Warren Commission tells us, well, that was just part of general directions issued to all the officers. Well, the, the directions issued to all officers was go to Dealey Plaza. There was an APB, everybody available, go to Dealey Plaza. The only place in Dallas other than Dealey Plaza where anybody was sent was the order to go to Lee Harvey Oswald's neighborhood, as it turns out, Oak Cliff. So why in the heck do they do that? Well, we know the Warren Commission told us that because they want, didn't want us to make the inference that Tippett was up to something else. Uh, uh, now, Oswald left the book, left his boarding house. He returned past the oops, Mexican restaurant, uh, he got, instead of going into the Mexican restaurant, he got no more than two blocks when Tippett stopped him. So what was Tippett up to? Well, what I'm suggesting, of course, is that maybe that Mexican restaurant was the meeting place, and if so, was Tippett trying to retrieve him to get back to that meeting place? Did Tippett go by his boarding house and signal him to get the move, get, get onto that place? Did the Warren Commission have a more plausible explanation for what he was up to. Well, the best they could come up with was the idea that Oswald had uh, stopped Oswald because he looked like the wanted man in Dealey Plaza. Can you go ahead and play that? Okay, 1244. Adam? 
Okay, so when we set aside the Winchester part, uh, this is a completely nondescript description. This is a man who is not fat, not thin, not tall, not short, uh, about 30-something. So average height, average weight, and for that reason, Oswald, who was only 24 years old, weighed 131 pounds, was stopped because he was fit that description, according to the Warren Commission. So what exactly, why did Tippett stop him? In uh, another problem is that doesn't fit with that idea, that Warren Commission idea, was the witnesses said that Tippett actually drew his gun. So he pulled his gun on Oswald because he looked like the average white guy. Now, one of the problems is that the witnesses who saw the murder said the alleged perp, presumably Oswald, ran down... Uh, Patton Street, and then from there, Jefferson Boulevard down to the movie theater. Uh, the witnesses, however, who came to the scene because they heard the shooting, people who lived in the neighborhood and came out on the street, those witnesses said they saw a man running down 10th Street. In fact, Mrs. Markham said the perp ran right past her. And one witness, Akilah Clemens, said she saw two men run away in two different directions. So how do we reconcile that? Where could that second perp come from. Maybe it wasn't a perp. Maybe it was just a bystander. But where did he come from? Well, one place he might have come from was out of that squad car. It might have been the second cop. A breakthrough in the case came many years later when a researcher named Dale Myers discovered that there was a newsreel. A news team had got to the scene and had filmed the detectives while they were working the scene of the crime, and they had found a man's wallet, a man's billfold, and were uh, looking at it. Now, whose billfold could that have belonged to? There's nothing in the Warren report about a billfold at the scene. More importantly, nothing in the police report about a billfold being at the scene. So we have uh, agent, FBI agent Hosty, James Hosty, uh, who was the man to whom Oswald was the informant, tell us in his book, well, that was Lee Harvey Oswald's wallet. And that proves that Lee Harvey Oswald was the killer of J.D. Tippett. And it's too bad that uh, uh, Agent Hosty is no longer with us so we could explain to him that uh, Lee Oswald did not drop his wallet at the scene of the crime because when he asks us how we know that, we can tell him, you're the detective, you figure it out. <laughs> we also know that it wasn't Tippett's wallet because Tippett's wallet was among his effects when he was taken to the hospital. So unless it was Oswald's wallet planted at the scene, then we were left with maybe it was a bystander, but why would they cover it up? Why would it not be in the report if it was just a bystander that dropped their wallet? Well, one of the police officers involved told Myers that, in fact, there was a bystander that didn't get into the record, and they kept his name off because he was a Dallas policeman, and he was having an affair with a lady in the neighborhood. And so they did not want to squeal on this married man having an affair with a woman in the neighborhood, so they kept his man off the record, his name off the record. How noble, how noble was it of the Dallas police to keep the name of a witness to the murder of the century off the record to protect his reputation? Uh, well, unless there was a whole lot of cops having a whole lot of affairs with a whole lot of ladies in, in Oak Cliff, we're pretty sure that's got to be a guy named Harry Olson. Okay, Harry Olson... Uh, has the distinction of being the one police officer that shortly after the assassination resigned from the police department and left town. Now, the FBI went looking for him because in the testimony of Jack Ruby, when uh, Earl Warren asked Jack Ruby, where did you get the idea to kill Oswald, he said it was a policeman named Harry Olson that told him he should uh, be killed before he stands trial. And according to Ruby, this happened on the wee hours of Saturday morning when he was cruising through downtown and he saw one of his employees, a, an exotic dancer named Kathy Kay, uh, with her boyfriend, Harry Olson, and he stopped to talk to them. And that's when Harry Olson had said, uh, you know, they should cut to ribbons. He should, before he saved the county, the cost of putting this guy on trial. 
So the FBI found him out in Long Beach, California. He was shacked up with Kathy Kay. And so it was that Arlen Specter got on a plane and flew out to Long Beach to interview the happy couple at the Spring Street Post Office. And, of course, he asked him uh, if it were true that he had uh, told Ruby to kill Oswald, and he denied that. And then he asked him why did he resign from the police department. And he said it was because uh, Police Chief Curry told him to resign. And so Specter said, well, why did he tell you to resign? And he said, I can't remember. <laughs> so then Specter asked him, okay, where were you at the time of the assassination? Where were you on that day? And he said he was guarding an estate. And so Specter asked him what was the name of the estate, and he couldn't remember. Okay, well, that's kind of remarkable because everybody my age knows where they were when John F. Kennedy was killed. And this guy's a Dallas cop, a friend of Jack Ruby's, but he can't remember where he was. So Specter asked him, how could that be? And he said, well, he wasn't the regular guard. It was another motorcycle cop that had duty guarding the president, so he was taking his place. And so Specter said, well, fine. So what's, what was the name of that police officer? He said, I can't remember. <laughs> okay, so that sounds like perp amnesia to me. So then he asked him, well, how was it that you got the day off? Because Chief Curry had testified that all leave was canceled because every able-bodied man was needed to provide uh, security for the president that day. And he said he couldn't work that day because he had a broken leg. <laughs> so Specter reminded him, this is how well prepared Specter was for this interview. Specter reminded him that the hospital record he had checked, he knew about it, that he broke his leg on the 8th of December, two weeks after the assassination. <laughs> So now he turned to Kathy Kay and asked Kathy Kay if she could vouch for where this guy was. And Kathy Kay said no because she had gone shopping that day. In fact, she had borrowed Harry's car because Harry had spent the night with her at her apartment, and so she had gone shopping. So Specter said, well, then you must know where the estate is because surely you dropped him off. And she said, no, she hadn't. So he asked Hank, uh, Harry Olson, he said, well, then how did you get to the estate? He says, I walked. On your broken leg, how far did you walk on your, on your broken leg? And he said, well, just a couple of blocks. And, well, Kathy Kay's apartment is in Oak Cliff. It's on 8th and Ewing, which is just a couple of blocks away from where Tippett was murdered. So uh, he has placed himself essentially on foot in the neighborhood. By the way, he, his work records show he worked on Thursday, the day before, and he worked on Monday. So the only day he took off was on the, uh, the day of the assassination. A couple of years later, uh, a researcher caught up with him uh, during the garrison. Uh, uh, Bill Turner found him and interviewed him. And, of course, Oak Cliff is a rundown neighborhood. It's, there's no estates anywhere in Oak Cliff. The witnesses to the Tippett murder were black people like Aquila Clems and Hispanics like Domingo Benavides. Uh, there were no estates in Oak Cliff. So now he's changed his story, and he said, you know, actually, he called an estate because... Uh, it was a deceased person, that he, and it was a rundown, dilapidated house, and he had a guard to keep it from being looted, and it was a lawyer that asked him, not a cop, and so he completely changed his, uh, his story. So, of course, uh, Specter just laughs it off and lets him go. Well, now it's in the radio log. Uh, yeah, that's the interview. Okay, and that's Bill Turner. And the radio log is where we have some important clues. Immediately after that broadcast where it says, you know, look for the average white guy with a 30-30, uh, the dispatcher, a guy named Murray Jackson, ordered two policemen, 87, which is a guy named Ronald Nelson, and 78 Tippett, to go into Central Oak Cliff. Tippett responded that he was at Keystone Bonnie View, which is, in fact, out by the Cedar Crest Golf Course. And Nelson was on the freeway. He was on his way into... Uh, downtown. A few minutes later, Nelson called back and said that he was now downtown on Houston Street. And then a few minutes later, at 1255, the dispatcher, now this is with all the radio traffic about the Kennedy assassination, the president been assassinated, Murray Jackson keeps calling up Tippett to find out where he's at and what he's doing. And he says, uh, so he calls him 78, he says, you are in Oak Cliff area, are you not? And he says, yeah, I'm at Lancaster and 8th. And he tells him, be at large for any emergency. Well, Lancaster and 8th, if you look up here, that's right across the street from Kathy Kay's apartment. So it looks like the first place he went was to go, when he got to Oak Cliff, was to stop and pick up 
Harry, Harry Olson. The next radio call is, the, is, a, is apparently the last one that Tippett made at 108, and we say that because uh, the two, well, some of the witnesses who actually looked at their watch, uh, Mrs. Markham looked at her watch when she saw the cop. She said it was 106, and then Ted Bowley, right after, after Tippett was shot, uh, he looked at his watch and said it was 110. So the 108 was probably when Tippett was calling in to let the dispatcher know that he was getting out of the car because that was standard protocol. Anytime you got out of your radio car, you would notify the dispatcher that you were going to be out of service. So that was probably the time of the shooting. A few minutes later, uh, T.F. Bowley grabbed the, uh, uh, the police radio and made the final call. Go ahead. Okay, so the first thing the dispatcher did when he heard somebody was shot, he started calling Tibbet. He immediately suspected that something's wrong. Uh, the dispatcher, Murray Jackson, was never interviewed by the Warren Commission or by the FBI. Uh, well, with one proviso. A few years later, uh, a reporter caught up with him and asked him why did he send Tibbet to Oak Cliff. And a revealing answer, he said, well, I, I'll tell you the same thing I told the FBI, okay, except there is no FBI report on inter ever interviewing uh, Murray Jackson. But what he said was, well, I felt like Oak Cliff needed to be reinforced because all these police officers were going into uh, Dealey Plaza. Well, the only place he reinforced just happened to be Lee Harvey Oswald's neighborhood, which doesn't make any sense because he abandoned his assigned area, so that's the one that's abandoned, and Central Oak Cliff, Officer Mensel, was actually still there. Uh, his Tippett's uh, wife, Marie, tells us that, in fact, Murray Jackson was his closest friend, that before he became a radio dispatcher, Murray Jackson was a patrol officer, and he was partners with uh, J.D. Tippett. Uh, so then the House Select Committee, years later, asked him again, why did you send your, your close friend to his death there in, in Oak Cliff? And well, he couldn't remember. Now he can't remember. So there's that perp amnesia again. Lo and behold, a few minutes later, who calls in? But it's Ronald Nelson. He calls in and he says, uh, almost apologetically, well, I'm here at my car at Elman Houston. You want me to go over there, meaning out to Oak Cliff? And... Instead, remarkably, this is a new dispatcher because Murray Jackson is so upset, if that's what it is, about his friend being killed, he's abandoned his post. He's left the station. So now a new dispatcher's there, and the dispatcher amazingly tells him to go to a gas station and to check out a suspect, Signal 19, the shooting of the president. They've already got uh, a suspect in the shooting of the president, and, of course, this is lost to history because this is a phone call. That's the, that somebody at the gas station has called this in. So why are they suspicious? But first I want to talk about who Ronald Nelson is. He's implicated in the murder of Oswald. Uh, when Jack Ruby killed uh, Oswald, it happened down here in the basement of the police station, and so the question was how the heck did uh, Ruby get in there when supposedly it was guarded all the entrances, none of the public was allowed in there. Ruby claimed that he drove, up, he walked down this ramp at the same time that a police car driven by a guy named Rio Pierce drove out. Well, Rio, I spoke to Rio Pierce. He's very adamant that that never happened. He never, Ruby never walked right past him. And in fact, the Warren Commission, at least Bert Griffin, the lawyer who was investigating the case, knew that that was not true because he knew that the there was a newsreel that showed that Ruby was there before Tip, the Rio Pierce's car had driven out. So he knew that was a lie. Uh, 
And he knew, therefore, that the cops, the Dallas policemen who were telling him that Ruby's story was true and trying to back it up, he knew they were lying, too. So Bert Griffin at one point lost it. He told a, a cop named uh, 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 William Newman that he was a damn liar, and he thought he knew why he was lying. And then the following day, he told another policeman named Patrick Dean, who was the guy in charge of security, he, said, he told you, you're a goddamn liar. And Patrick Dean turned him in to the Warren Commission, and so the Warren Commission pulled Griffin off the case. He says, you're off the case. You're not going to interview anybody else. You're sent back to Washington. So Leon Hubert, his partner, resigned to spend more time with his family. Uh, and uh, that's why we wind up with Arlen Magic Bullet Theory Specter going out to California to interview damn liars like Harry Olson instead of uh, a guy like Burt Griffin. Uh, the point is that during, Griffin also knew that during the uh, police internal investigation of how Ruby got in there, three different cops had said Ruby came through the jail office door, and the person that was assigned to guard the jail office door was Ronald Nelson. So that's where he comes in. All right, so now Nelson gets this call. It tells him to get out to West Davis to get to this gas station to look for the suspect, find out what the gas station people know. And he says, okay, they came in there in a white station wagon, had a rifle in the back seat, and a citizen is following them. Okay, there's got to be more to it than just having a rifle in the back seat. This is Texas. Okay, this is the middle of deer season. So half the, this is not even in Dallas, the town. It's actually outside of town. So it can't possibly just be a rifle in the back seat. One has to suspect that these people said something or did something that caused the gas station attendant to call in, call the police to have somebody come out there, and a citizen is actually following these guys. So now uh, the dispatcher tells uh, Nelson to go ahead and follow this, go in, follow the citizen, follow the car, go into the, uh, uh, oh, this is where it is. I went out there with the hopes of finding a gas station, maybe somebody remembered something, but it's a used car lot today. You can still see the islands where the gas station, the tanks used to be. So anyway, so now uh, Nelson says he's going to go on down into Central Oak Cliff, and the dispatcher tells him, when you get down there, see if you can find that car, that white station wagon. To put this into perspective, can I get a pointer on here somewhere? Whoop. Okay. All right. So here's downtown, you go down here, and here's the gas station out on West Davis. The car, the white station wagon is last seen headed into Oak Cliff because West Davis turns in 8th Street, and that's 500 North Beckley. That's where the restaurant is. So this is where they're looking for the, uh, the assassin, the murderer Tippett. So the police dispatcher now connects these two. They put it together. For the next 15 minutes, they're telling him not only to look for the guy that killed Tippett, but look out for the white station wagon. In fact, one of them, uh, one of the policemen, a deputy, calls in and says, well, is he on foot or is he in a car? And he says, well, he's on foot last time we saw him. But they've connected this white station wagon with the murder of Tippett, and, of course, it was the first place was a call that might be involved in the shooting of the president, and then Lee Harvey Oswald gets arrested, and everybody forgets about the white station wagon. Until a few weeks later, when this guy, the future mayor of Dallas, Wes Wise, just happens to give a dinner speech out at a restaurant in Oak Cliff, and it's the Mexican restaurant. And after he gives his, gives his speech, a man comes up to him, and he says, my name is Mac Pate. I own the garage behind the Mexican restaurant, and on the afternoon of the assassination, a strange event happened, and my, one of my mechanics was a witness to it. They were, but he's afraid to go to the police and tell them because of these strange things that their murder, the witnesses are being murdered. So why said, well, he can talk to me because I protect my sources. So it turns out that the mechanic in the case was a reserve police officer. Can you imagine that? A reserve police officer was afraid to go to the police to tell his story. So he tells Wise, he says, at the, that afternoon, he said there was a car pulled in behind the restaurant, and these guys were acting like they were hiding. 
So he, what made him suspicious especially was because it was at a time when squad cars with their sirens going were racing through the neighborhood. So he put down his tools and he walked across the street to ask these guys what they were up to. And when he did, they jumped in the car and peeled rubber and, and peeled out of the uh, restaurant parking lot. But he wrote down the license plate number. And he gave it to Wise. And Wise gave the license plate number to the FBI. So the FBI traced the number uh, to a Plymouth station wagon uh, belonging to a man named Carl Amos Mather out in Garland, Texas. So the FBI went out there and knocked on the door, and a lady answered, and uh, they asked to speak to Carl, and she, and she said, well, he's at work. And by the way, the report states that it was a white over blue station wagon parked in the, in the driveway with that license plate number. And so they asked uh, uh, Mrs. Mather, well, where does he work? And she says, well, he works at Collins Radio. Well, where have we heard Collins Radio before? Well, it's in the testimony of Mary Bledsoe when the Warren Commission, who was his landlady, when they asked her if what was Oswald up to, and she said, well, he's going out to Collins Radio. He's trying to get on there. He's going to get a job out there. He's gone out there a couple times. Heck, I don't know, maybe just a coincidence. Uh, but when they asked her, does she know if Carl worked on the day that Kennedy was assassinated, she said, well, he did, but he came home early that day because we had to go over to Marie Tippett's house to console her because we're close friends with the Tippetts. So we are supposed to believe that it's all just a coincidence that this guy must have wrote down the wrong license plate number out of two million registered cars in Texas, and he came up with somebody that was a close friend of Tippetts. And furthermore, who drove a white station wagon, and it was at the Mexican restaurant, the very place that Oswald had stated as his destination. Um, in addendum, Carl Mather was never questioned by the FBI. They just took what his wife said and decided it was all just a big coincidence. He was asked by the House Select Committee, and he declined to be interviewed. Uh, Officer Ronald Nelson was never questioned by the FBI or by the Warren Commission or by the House Select Committee. Uh, he told, re told uh, researchers that he would tell a story for a large sum of money, which I say, why do we, what are we paying the FBI for, right? Uh, Harry Olson could not be found. He has disappeared. But his wife, Kathy Kay, turned up, and she tells us that Olson lied. That's a news flash. P specifically, he lied about not knowing Oswald. She said he did know Lee Harvey Oswald. Akila Clemens was never questioned by the FBI. Uh, she claims the police told her to keep her mouth shut. Earlene Roberts was also harassed by the police over the next uh, few months. So that's, that's, that's my story. Questions? Shocking. Well, then, then thank you, Dr. 